Ladies and gentlemen, what's up? Welcome back to Wade Files. Of course, my name is Red West. On this week's episode, wow, I haven't physically seen my friend, wow, in maybe about five or six years, but in those five or six years, he's been cooking. Um, we've talked over the phone and text, you know, just to catch up, but he's picked up a few Grammys since I've seen him. He's added a few more things to his repertoire. He's a, a producer, a mixer, an engineer, a songwriter. People, we're going to get into all his accolades, Beyonce, BTS, Fab, Jay Sean, everybody. But listen, <laughs> this is one of my friends. This is going to be a great conversation, I promise you. <laughs> DJ Swivel! What's up, Reg? It's good to see you. Me? Good to hear from you. Good to I like it. My friend. I, like, you, I like the setup here. Thank you, man. This, this is this yeah. is this. So, so just, just, just to give you a, a, a full disclosure of what this really is, it's part giving my friends flowers, it's part educational for for people who who, who are watching, and it's part of it's part just us catching up. Like COVID yeah. for, for for me, it's been like I haven't seen anybody, I don't talk to anybody, everybody's kind of in their own little shell. But this gives me a, a chance to catch up with my creative friends and give the people some gems while we just catch up. I love it. And and the education angle is big for me too. Cause I, I love that stuff. I, I like going and talking at schools and I got my YouTube that does a lot of educational stuff. So I'm always for that. Absolutely. And, and we're, we're going to get to those story time YouTubes at yep. some point in this conversation. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> people, this, this is my friend, DJ Swivel. Um, he is a mix engineer extraordinaire. You, you've definitely heard some of his work. You've sang to some of his songs over the years. Um, Wow, uh, Swivel, not to not to not to pop your own collar, but but run down a few people, please. Uh, uh, Beyonce. I'll do it for you. 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 Yeah. I'll do it for you. Beyonce. BTS. Fab. Jay Sean. Kanye. Uh, Lil Nas X. 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 Lil yeah, <laughs> the list goes on and on and on and on. And yeah. in some aspects, Swivel has been the the mix engineer. In some aspects, Swivel has been the songwriter. Um, he's just getting plaques and awards and Grammys all over the place. Um, but we're gonna talk and we're gonna get into really the importance of all that. You know what I mean? Because being an artist in the music industry, it's really a what's next industry. You know, like you can never just sit down on your on your rest board. on your laurels no nope. rest on your laurels that's that's yeah. what i was aiming for but i but yeah. I, I, I couldn't get I got out you. properly you're thinking the same thing <laughs> i got you absolutely um Il swivel man can, can you tell the people how you got involved in the business um i know you started off interning in in new york city but prior to that you went well, to it started before and- that but that was like that was the first step that really got my career going but really that's- the music as a from a professional started in toronto um, in high school, I was DJing and I was playing nightclubs and stuff like that while I was in high school. Um, and then, you know, I actually won the music award in high school and I was like, man, I should really pursue a career in music. And, you know, I have a twin brother who also shared that music award with me. He, he had some music in him too. And he opted to just go for your university and like do a, you know, regular bachelor's degree. And, I said, nah, that doesn't really feel like it's for me. And so I went to uh, Florida and went to school at Full Sail, then moved to New York. And that's where I got the internship with Duro. And that's kind of where my career started. But I was like, if it didn't happen in New York, I would have pursued music in Toronto or somewhere else. So, 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 so why, why Full Sail and then why New York? Like, like, like just because at the time Toronto wasn't the hub. For, no, you know, Dre, this it, was pre. This is pre. Drake. Pre. Drake, P. Justin, this is like, pre Justin Bieber. Well, actually, yeah. early Justin Bieber, right? Early no, Justin no, Bieber. no. Pre Bieber. Bieber would have right, been right, like right. Uh, four or something. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, I'm aging myself <laughs> a bit. I'm aging myself a bit here, but uh, no. Um, because I actually worked on some of the writing sessions on Bieber's first album. That was like, well, I was was already in New York for a number of years at that point. So uh, I moved to New York in 2005. I went to Full Sail in 2004. The reason I went to Full Sail, honestly, was because I did want a career in the US and it was the easiest way for me to get a visa. And so Mm. I had heard about the school. I knew about the school. I knew the pedigree that they had. And I could have 
I actually did apply to a school in um, in Ontario, just out, uh, in London, Ontario, a school called Fanshawe, and I didn't get in. They had a, have a much smaller music program, and I didn't get in in my first year. So I said, man, I'll just go down to full sale, and then I'll get a visa to be able to – or at least a student student visa to be able to stay in the U S for at least a year or two years. I can't I think it gave me one year after gotcha. graduation. I had an extra year to like make something happen. Gotcha. And for me, it was like, I had to make something happen that year. Cause to get the next visa, I needed a sponsor. So I needed a job that was willing to sponsor me in my field. And so I got a land in my first internship at a different studio on the lower East side. It was called East side sound. And I worked there for a couple months and, um, to be honest, I just didn't see a whole lot of upward mobility. They weren't working on any artists that I cared about. It was kind of like, it was a beautiful studio, but like with kind of what they were working on was like in, in for what I cared about was like irrelevant to me. And gotcha. so I was like, so I actually just quit, which was like a really scary thing. Cause I didn't have another job, but I was like, I know that I'm not going to get to where I need to get to here. These are not mm -hmm. the people I want to be learning from. Uh -huh. I got to quit. So I just stopped showing up. And I just, I was actually working with Full Sail to get my resume out to other studios and, and things like that. And then this Duro opportunity came up and they reached out. They said, hey, you know, we have this engineer he's looking for, or this mixer, he's looking for an assistant. I mean, that even mixers, Kali Duro mixer is like totally underselling what Duro does, but he's so much bigger than just a mixer. But anyways, he's got a studio. Do you want to go? And I, and I looked him up. I was like, oh my God, I know who Duro is. Like like fab and jay-z and like all these other things he like he's worked on so many different things dj clue like all that desert storm that was all him i was like i'm a fan like i'm genuinely a fan um when i was djing back in toronto i was like playing fab like back to back like i i love the music so i i had to go for that interview so i went and um uh, i submitted my resume and then i actually got a, a an email back from his assistant at the time a guy named josh and he emailed me saying, hey, we got your resume and we thought it looked really great, but you mentioned your DJ on your resume and we've had problems with DJs leaking uh... music. And so actually, like, this is just a courtesy email where we, we're not hiring you, but, you know, I suggest if you want a job in studios, you should take the DJ stuff off your resume. He's like, thank you. Have a nice life pretty much. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm not really, I don't, I hate hearing no. And that just like drives me more. So uh, I kind of just responded and was like, I just basically begged for an interview. I said, I would never leak music. I want this more than anything. Give me a shot. Let me come meet him. Let me come meet you guys. And like, just, just meet me. And they said, well, we've already filled the position, but if you want to come for a studio tour, we'll show you around. I was like, all right, I'll take what I can get. Right. And then I just, I went up there super humble and just uh, got a tour of the studio, got to meet Duro. And actually he sat down and interviewed me. So I don't know if they had actually hired somebody or if that was just something they said. Right. Um, but, uh, but either way he interviewed me, but as far as I was concerned, when I left, it was just like, all right, well, maybe I'll, I'll be a backup. Um, and I, when I left, I thought, all right, nothing's going to happen of it. They already hired somebody. It's, it's all good. So I just right. went about my, my, uh, business. And then I think it was during my Christmas holiday. I, uh, cause this was towards, I think I interviewed like end of November, maybe a few weeks later, I went home for the holidays. Um, and then while I was home, I got a call saying, Hey, we need you, you know, you start January 2nd. So I was oh. like, and I was going to stay through the new year. So I'm like moving my flight up early. I'm getting back. So I was ready to go. So yeah. And then I, that was my first, first job. And that was the thing that really sent me on my, my path. That was the so, first time I felt like I, I felt home. So, 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 so you, so you landed the, the internship with Duro. I know Duro worked you crazy you, yeah. with the, with the long hours, but it, but it all paid My off. First week was uh, over 120 hours, but honestly, still to this day, not Ooh. 120 hours in the studios. I swear to God. Um, my first day on the day one, January 2nd, I got there at probably 10 AM. I didn't mm -hmm. leave until 10 AM the next day. And I left for about six hours, got a little sleep, came right back and stayed uh, 36 hours straight. And then I left and then stayed another 30. I left for six hours, go shower, change, and came back for another 30. So that's how I put in, I was, I basically worked seven days a week. Like I slept for six hours and then I was at the studio every other moment. Uh, but it never felt like work though. 
So like, hold on, hold on. So, so 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 was it you and so was it you and Duro the entire time he was in there no, with it you? Was and you Duro, guys? his assistant Josh and me, and Josh would be handling all the music stuff, and I would be basically cleaning, uh, fetching, going on food runs, you know, supply runs. Like I was the just intern. Uh, the intern. I was just running around doing whatever I needed to do. But because it was a small, like intimate space, it's just Duro, his assistant, and me. There's only three people in that whole space. Right. It allowed for those moments when everything was done, everything's clean, everything's good, all the clients are taken care of. You know, it was a little more relaxed. So I could sit in on a session and be quiet and like watch what he's doing and just kind of be a sponge. And that was really appealing to me because in the bigger studios, like if you go and work at Sony Studios or Right Track or, you know, Hit Factory or w w any of them. There's like a very structured regimen and you can't just walk into another person's session. It just, just right. doesn't work that way. Right. So, but because I'm like Duro's intern and Duro is the person who's having the session, it made it easier to be able to walk in. And that's how I kind of met. I remember within two months, like I'm sitting next to Diddy and I created his first MySpace for him. He had no idea what my MySpace Wait, was. He what? saw me on it. I swear, I swear to God, this is not a lie. You can check. Duro has told this story in, in public as well. Um, I'm just in the back and he sees me on my laptop and he's like, yo, what's that? I was like, oh, you don't know about MySpace? It's like, no, tell me about it. And I just sat and told him, it's like it's social media. Like you basically create a page and then all your fans can connect with you and become your friend there. And you can message them and let them know about what you have going on. If you have a concert or you have an album dropping, whatever. He's like, I need that. <laughs> yeah, how, do, how do I get one? How do I get one? How do I know you're going to do it in that voice? <laughs> take that, take that, take yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So he's like, how do I get one? I was like, I'll make you one. He's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, sure. I'll make you one right now. But you got to put me in your top eight. He's like, I don't even know what that is. So I was like, cool, I got you. So I made him his first MySpace and I put myself number one on his top eight. And I was there for a couple months until he figured out what it was, I guess. What it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Raised the> shit. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, true, true story. Yo, that's very crazy. So, so, but so that, would, that would not have happened in a normal studio environment. That only happened because of, it was a very small, like intimate space. There was one studio. There was a second like production room, but it wasn't, it was just more like a closet that had some gear in it. Um, and yeah, just one studio. So when Duro was working, it was like, we were just there to support him really. No, that's dope. I, I, I yeah. can, I can relate to a degree because a lot of people don't know. Like I started off interning in, in recording studio myself. I worked at a studio out in Long Island called Rock and Reel. And okay. anybody, anybody who worked out in Long Island, like, like Redman, EPMD, Keith Murray, they were out there. Um, I, I, actually never had a chance to sit in with any of those Alicia sessions. Was out there too, right? I don't know if she was Alicia. at that studio, but she had, she had, um, what was it called? She she did some work out, yeah, out, of, out of Long Island Studios, but it wasn't that one. Yeah. The one she worked out of was in Nassau County. I forget the yeah. name of that one, but 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 right, uh, Rock and Reel was out in Suffolk. Um, okay. Yeah, I think the one she was at was in Glen Cove. I think that's the one she was at. Yeah, um, she, I mean, she built her hers out there. I remember in the oven, and that would have been prior. That would have been around that time for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so I, I have an understanding of 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 uh, vacuuming, running to the Seven yep, Eleven. Yeah, all the. <laughs> And depending on some... what the session is, like it could be a blunt run or it could be, uh, you know, like a solid run. Like it just, you know, right. Um, so, 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 so I completely understand. But yeah, but, but I'm, I'm, see, I'm glad I, I did my internship while I was in college because I, I originally went to college for engineering, but I oh, realized what, while I was interning, I didn't want to be a, an engineer. Like it, it just seemed so, like. You know, I mean, so, so you know me, man. Like, I, I like to jump around. I need to be here, there, yeah, there, you, here. You wanna, yeah, you're you're the sh you're the face of the party. So you you gotta be front. I want to be more. And active, that's not really so, an engineer's role, right? Yeah. So so I I realized in interning that this is not what I want to do. I yeah. I under I, I'm glad I took the opportunity to to intern and understand it, but it just wasn't for me. Um, but that's a beautiful thing because you know I was really lucky growing up. My mom instilled this thing like. I don't care what you do with your life. Just whatever you choose, make sure you're happy because nothing right. is worse than being in a, in a place where you're unhappy and you're just doing it for money. And so what's beautiful about what you just said is, you know, you learned something you didn't like. And that means, all right, cool. I know I love music, but this is not the place I want to be. Um, so you have to make that shift. And that's kind of why I quit that first internship 
Facts. having nothing behind it. Cause I knew like, if this is what the future is for me, I don't want it. It just, it didn't feel, I just didn't feel that, that positive energy behind it. So that's why I moved on. Um, so, but that's an amazing thing. And I feel like more people, a lot of people don't do that out of fear. And that's like a horrible way to live your life worried about all the, like you can't live your life in fear. You just have to be fearless, go after whatever you want and good things will happen. You put that energy out there. It'll, it'll come back to you. So that, that's a fact. Um, yeah. So, so with, with, with your internship, how long, how long of an internship did you have with Duro un, un, until you moved over to a, a paid in, uh, uh, worker, sir? I mean, Okay. So here, here's, I actually told Duro this early and this just shows my commitment and how badly I wanted it. Right. Um, I was there for maybe a month and I pulled him to the side and I said, listen, you never have to pay me a dime ever in your life. The opportunity is all I ever wanted. Just all I ask is when you see an opportunity for me to like level up and grow, if it's a engineering gig or whatever, just like, please consider me for it. But you never have to pay me a dime. I'll, and even to this day, if Duro was in a bind and he needed me to set up some sessions for him or do something, I'd do it just because I wouldn't be here without him. He opened um, the door. So I, I said that, said that early. So I was always an intern for Duro. Um, I technically interned for him for three years, but that was by design. I, for three years, I wasn't paid, but I asked for it to be that way because what I said is when the opportunities come, throw me in the fire. And he did. And I'm super grateful for that because a lot of people, you know, if you're doing good in this place, like they don't want to see you grow. They don't want to see exactly. you elevate. They want to keep you in your box over there. And Duro was never that way. He always gave me the opportunity. And so seven months into the internship, so about five months into the internship, may, or maybe four months, his assistant, Josh, quit. And he mm. took a job elsewhere. And that's how music works. Somebody quits, you level up. That's how it works. Excellent. So Excellent. now I'm now I'm the assistant, and you know, but we still needed help. So he actually hired a second assistant. So now there's two assistants. This is actually a funny story too. Um, and uh, I can't remember his name. I want to say it was Khalil, but uh, that might be. I I can't remember. But anyways, um, we had two assistants, me and 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 this new kid, and we were basically like both vying for like what the next gig is going to be. And it seemed like fab was ready to start recording his next album, which was what, and so which was from nothing to something. Ah, so okay. he had been coming in doing some mixtape stuff more and more. I had been building a relationship with him, and about uh, six months into the internship, I just, I could tell fab was getting ready to record an album. So I pulled her to the side again. I said, remember I told you, you know, you never have to pay me. Like, I, I, I want that gig. Like I'll do anything, you know, throw me in the, I re give me a shot at at least earning fabs respect to be able to do it. And he didn't, you know, if you, you know, Dora, like he's a quiet dude. He, we didn't have Absolutely. these very open conversations. I'll say something right. like that. And he'll be like, okay. And like, not really, <laughs> he'd give me no, no positive <laughs> affirmation, nothing. Just like very, no, it's, not, you know, it's nothing to read. You can't read it. You can't read it. It's just like, was that okay? Like, get back to work. Was that okay? Like, no, I got you. What? Like there, I didn't know. It just seemed like, okay, so I'll just go back to doing what I'm doing. And then, <laughs> and then when, F and I had started building a relationship with fab, he would come in, we'd have a couple jokes, like whatever, just casual he sees me every day. So you're going to become friendly with somebody. Right. And then when fab started working out from nothing to something, uh, it was kind of me and this assistant who were both vying for that gig. And I ended up getting it. Um, and, uh, that, and then that's kind of what happened. I became fabs engineer. And so what I would do is I would intern for Duro during the day. So I'd mm -hmm. show up at the studio, 10, 11 AM work with him until he's done. So like seven, eight, 9 PM. And yeah. then at 9 PM fab would come in and he would work till like 4 AM. So I'd work with fab for six or eight hours at night, depending on when he showed up. Um, and then at like six in the morning when it's the light outside and you know, the street sweepers are out in New York and like, you know, all, all that. So I'd be making my way home and I would get like four or five hours sleep. And then I wake up and do the same thing again. As soon as I was up, get straight to the studio, uh, help out Duro with whatever he needed. Cause he was mixing during the day. And then at nighttime fab would come in and it was like, I was on this 24 hour 
cycle and I was getting paid for the fab gigs, but I was interning for Duro, but I was, that was by design. I was totally happy with that. Um, in fact, I insisted on it, uh, because to this day, like, I feel like he did. So what he did for me is gave me a career and the, whatever pay I would have gotten as an intern, 10 bucks an hour or whatever is like the career is so much more valuable than that. I was like, I didn't care. I didn't no, care. It's facts. It's facts yeah. because you, because he's still, you're still learning anyway. Right. Like, yeah. You're still, you're, you're still picking seven up months, nuances. Seven months to go from a GA, like first stepping into the studio to being a platinum selling artist, fabulous main recording engineer in seven months. That doesn't happen. Nope. But that happened because I I put the the work in front of the money. I didn't think about any money at the time. No, and um, and, and 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 that's the smart play. Like I I I say this to to people all the time as as my analogy. You can go to school to be a lawyer, but you don't become a lawyer till you're in that courtroom. So right. with you with you working with Duro, interning, you're still picking up pieces of okay. Like yeah. let me let me let me, and it's just nuances too, right? Because artists are like. Artists are artists, right? So you you, yeah. you pick up how to deal with them, how to speak with them, how to talk I to them. I became a chameleon being in the studio because I can sit right. in – man, I worked with – like I remember MOP was upstairs. Like I work with uh, Ghostface, like, like, like some of the sickest rappers ever. But like you know, guys who come from a very different place than where I come from, right? But I right. learned how to sort of uh, coexist and like – and communicate in those types of sessions, but then also being in a Jay Sean session or like a Pharrell session or something like that. Um, you have to be like water. Like you have to adapt. Yeah. You got to be able to like, you know, I change how I speak and how I communicate and, and all that. So um, yeah, that was one of the things I learned early, just being able to read people and figure out like, how do I connect with this person? Uh, and like everybody's personality is different. So you have to sort of be adaptable. But that's a DJ talent, though, right? Because if you think about every it, every party's different, right? Yeah, every party's different, my friend. And you got to read gotta... even different times in the party is different. You got to read the energy and be able to like quickly switch if you yes. need. To. So yes, yes, very so, similar so, skill. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. So so fast forwarding. Um. You 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 did how many albums did you work on with Fab Two? Right. Two full albums, so From Nothing to Something and Loso's Way, plus I worked on probably four mixtapes. Um, there is no competition. There is no competition two. I can't remember if I worked on Tink three. I may have also worked on No Competition three, plus Soul mm -hmm. Tape one. I produced on that. Um, I remember that soul, yo, soul tape one man. Yeah. That was so. So for, for anyone who doesn't know, I was DJing for Fab ironically during the same time frame and yep. and uh but did we yeah. meet through fab first or jared first no we met through jared first and and yeah. then i saw you with fab i was with like fab. and this I is a very up. small yeah, world yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah um but yeah uh that's that's I, when i saw your name on a soul tape project i'm like okay my yeah. man is just my man is just not engineering out here He's yeah like, hey, get 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 that was some, my get, first some money it's funny it was just the was it the 10th anniversary yes. this past week yeah, and I, I saw Fab tweeted about it. I wouldn't have remembered it was the tenth anniversary, so I saw he posted about it. So I posted about it as well. That was my first real placement with like a major. No, I, that's not true. Second, but the first one was with Consequence, who's dope, and I've known forever. He was actually the first person who gave me a shot. I would, mm. I would bring. He needed a studio, so I, when Duro wasn't working, I would bring him up to Duro's studio, and we just work. And he, I didn't. He wasn't paying for the studio or nothing. We were just working. Right. And I was looking at it like I was just trying to get my hours of engineering in, like being able to learn the craft. So if I had another artist up there, even if they weren't paying me, it was cool because I was able to like build with that artist. And also, you know, the power structure is different in that situation because he wasn't paying for the studio or paying me. I was just trying to build with him. That also opened the door for me to be able to play him beats and things like that. So actually, the first song I ever placed was with Consequence. Um, and then. Uh, and I remember I met like uh, like Kanye's cousin um, what was it? Uh, something Williams. Oh, I'm forgetting his name now. What's what the? Uh, he's a singer. I, he would sing on the on yeah the back yeah 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 on, yeah. He he, on, he, he, he was singing on all and, Kanye project. Yep. Uh, something Williams. Oh my god, that's driving me insane. But anyways, it'll, like it'll come back to you. 
you know, I started meeting some of the people in Kanye's crew and obviously consequence was with Kanye through all that, that whole thing. And I was a huge mm-hmm. fan of Kanye. So, um, so it was consequence, but then like the first, the first one that, you know, didn't feel like, like the consequence thing, I was kind of helping him out with the studio side. So it was more like just homies, but the right. first thing where it was like, I had to earn it, earn it was with fab. Got you. So, um, um, how, so, so, you know, fab was internal, obviously through Duro, Yeah. but how did you move on and, and start to, to garner more, um, uh, uh, engineering, clients. yeah. And yeah. engineering cr- cl- clients and credits. Yeah. So as I was doing fab, I was also working with all these other artists in New York. Um, and a lot of the engineering I would do would be while Duro's finishing mixing, like you know, the artist might come in. So I remember I did some sessions with Pharrell and Duro was mixing. He was mixing a bunch of Pharrell stuff at the time, but I remember Pharrell came in for these Britney Spears sessions. Mm -hmm. We we worked on uh, two songs from, uh, what was it called? Blackout, that album Blackout. I remember Blackout. Blackout had some records, man. That was just, yeah, great. So uh, one of them, Why Should I Be Sad, which which Pharrell produced and made the album, as Duro was mixing for, I wanted to add some things. So he came in and Duro doesn't record. So when it was time to record, he would throw me in the driver's seat and I'd, I'd work with Pharrell to do any recording. So he added some vocal things and little, uh, just, I don't know, little ad libs and things like that. To, to some color. Record. I got you. It's yeah. Just add, add, a, add a little color. And then we worked on another song, which actually didn't make the album, but, um, so we did two songs there. So that would be kind of where I would build the engineering gigs. And through that, I would meet, a lot of people. And also with fab, I would meet people. So I met Lenny S cause Lenny S was fab's a at the time. Shout to Lenny S. Yeah. At, at the, 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 the music whisperer Lenny S. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and then through that, I also met Omar Grant, who is now Shout the Omar president Grant. of yeah. rock nation. Like, but at the time, Omar, I think he was at EMI or something. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Lenny was at, uh, Def Jam. He first was at Virgin, then he was at Def Jam for the Fab thing. I actually first met him a few years earlier uh, when he right. was at Virgin. He was at Virgin. I remember that. He was at Virgin yes. Records. And then he moved to Def Jam. Then I met him again with Fab. And yeah, through that relationship, um, built a relationship with those guys. And I actually had asked Omar and Lenny to manage me. And for a brief period, they did. Uh, and one of those sort of uh, gigs... I mean, this is actually before they managed me, but it was kind of a, a, a layup that they did. Omar called me one day and was like, this is in 2010, beginning in 2010. So uh, Losa's Way had, had just come out a few months before, mm-hmm. um, maybe the, or six months before, maybe. And uh, Omar calls me. He's like, hey, Beyonce needs a, a fill-in. And I found out Omar was like actually the tour manager for Destiny's Child. So that's how he had a relationship. That's right. Uh, he called me one day. He's like, hey, Beyonce needs a fill-in. Do you want to do it? I was like, hell yeah, I want to do it. Um, so I showed up to rock the mic studios and I remember the first day, I don't think she showed up the first day. And then, uh, and then I came and then they said, could you come back the second day? And I came back the second day and then she showed up. Uh, and so then I, I did a couple days with her and then she left and I think she went on vacation for like six weeks or something. Uh-huh. And I thought, well, I was just filling in for her other engineer anyways. Like I certainly was not expecting to get a regular gig. And then she came back six weeks later. I got a call from her assistant, uh, Melissa. And she said, Hey, um, you know, B would like you to come back to the studio. Are you available? I said, absolutely. So I showed up and then I did a like four or five days of sessions with her. And then at the end, she's like, I'm about to start an album. Do you want to do the album with me? And I said, like obviously of course of course what do you um, mean <laughs> I, uh so anyways yeah so that that's how that happened but that was again that was through fab you know that's kind of how music goes met lenny s then met omar grant uh then uh, through omar got the link to beyonce and uh and then everything kind of stemmed from that you know how how was how was the beyonce process man because i know you you worked diligently on the four album um i yeah. think that was 2010 you guys were probably working it because it came out in 2010 and 2011 yeah we how, worked how? for a little over a year on it wow like man. a year what? and two months or something a year and three months and and and, and and you guys you, you guys weren't in new york you guys went flew out somewhere right no, no we were mostly in new york but we'd move okay. around studios and then we did like a week in london uh well in england we spent a few days in london we spent a few days 
uh, Jay and Kanye were doing Watch the Throne. And so we were uh, at Real World Studios, which is Peter Gabriel's studio, a beautiful space. If anybody ever gets a chance to go, like it's a gorgeous mm -hmm. studio. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to spend a few days up at Real World, which is in this little town called Box. It's outside of Bath. Um, it's near Stonehenge. If that okay. is helpful for anybody in the yeah, UK. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then after that, we went back to London and did like uh, five or six days of sessions in London. And then if and then like a month later, uh, we flew to Australia and did. Uh, Jay was opening up for U two on that claw. Remember that claw tour that they had that I, claw I stage. Remember. I remember. And it was like this enormous tour, and Jay was the opening act for U two. That's how big the tour is. You got Jay Z <laughs> as the opening act. <laughs> Levels, That's big levels, levels. Max. So, um, I mean, that stage was so big, it would take them a week just to set it up. So they're doing four nights in Sydney sold out for like a hundred thousand a night or 60,000 or 80,000 people a night, the crazy thing. So, right. um, so it made a lot of sense and they did four nights in Sydney and then they moved on to like Perth or something like that. So we just like locked in Kanye got this house in, uh, Australia. And that's, then I met like, actually I met some of them in, in, uh, the UK, but like Mike Dean and Virgil and, uh, you know, S one and like, uh, I hadn't, I'd known Ryan Leslie from the fab stuff, but Ryan Leslie was out there. Like right. all sorts of, con uh, I think consequences, like everybody w was out there. And so that allowed me to build new relationships as well. So spending all that time with Beyonce, pretty much a year of, 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 of your life. Um, what happened with your all your of the clients? Because I know as a just as a creative, like or anyone who owns their own business, you have multiple clients, right? And then you get sucked into one client. Did you come back to and to all your other clients? Were they still there? Did you pick up new clients? What happened after that? It's it really interesting because this was a a really important lesson I I had to learn. I had built up a like a consistent client base before Beyonce, where I would do two days here, five days here, a day here, you know, a week here, all different labels, different artists. You know, I had a, a steady sort of a flow of work. And then uh, when I work with Beyonce, she's like, you just got to be there. There, there is Facts. no like, oh, I'm not available. Sorry. And she reached You are on call. Yeah. You, are on you are on call, call. every yeah. day. Exactly. And so um, in doing that, I had to basically turned down a lot of sessions throughout the year because I couldn't, I just wasn't available. Right. And so, um, they all, all of those clients, you know, they moved on, they had to find other engineers and now they've worked with them for almost a year. Uh, you, you know, without me, like they're not going to just jump back. Now they've okay. built a, a relationship. So, uh, it was actually quite the opposite when Beyonce finished the album, I thought, Oh, I'm going to be busy. It's going to be great. Uh, and it was the total opposite. Like my phone was silent uh, because I think everyone assumes like, oh, you're locked in with B. Like, that's it. And, you know, one of the sort of uh, lessons I had to learn is like, you know, Beyonce is not uh, like she's not recording all the time. Right. It's not like she's Kanye, who if he's not working on his own album, he's working on somebody else's album. Kanye has got a studio going 365 days a year. There's no stop. Right. Right. Beyonce is not like that. She's going to work, get her album done. And then she might not step foot in a studio for another year or two or three. So, right. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that was a difficult lesson to learn because, you know, in working with her, you get accustomed to a certain lifestyle and earning a certain amount of money. And then, you know, what I realize is I'm not on salary. I'm an hourly, I'm a gig worker for her. So she's not doing the gig. I'm not getting paid. And it really, it, it really kind of messed me up for a few years. Um, you know, and I, like, I actually, there was an opportunity maybe three quarters of the way through the album. I got called from Def Jam, like, Hey, Kanye needs an engineer. Are you available today? And so I checked in with B's team and said, Hey, uh, I haven't been asked if been told we're working today. Is it cool? Like I have another session, you know, Kanye asked me to do a session. Um, I really want to do it. Like, is that okay? And they said, yeah, sure. No problem. Do your thing. Uh, what time is it? And I said, uh, s like seven 30 or something like that. And so half an hour before that session was supposed to start, I get a call from B's team saying, we need you at the studio right now. <laughs> and I was like, 
and Kanye relationship now destroyed. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Facts. So, so, you know, that was a, that was a tough pill to swallow. And then the guy who ended up, um, getting the gig after me, yeah. uh, a guy named Noah, we, we became friends. I, I haven't seen him in a couple of years, but really great guy and super talented engineer, uh, Noah Goldstein. Uh, he ended up, you know, working with Kanye for a number of years on every project. And, you know, he's, uh, a co-producer on the project and all this sort of stuff. And so, um, you know, it was like, you know, different styles of artists, right? Like B when, when she's doing an album, like she's locked in and that's all she's focused on, but she has so many other things that she has to also focus on. Right. Um, whereas like Kanye is a producer first now, I mean, now he's got sneakers and all the other things, but at the time he was like, he was just a, he was all, everything was music. And so 365 days a year, there was a studio that Kanye had booked somewhere. Right. Didn't matter where. Right. Uh, and so that was like, when I finished with, with B then I realized, okay, I need, I can't ever lock in with one client. And that's why I've, I will never be exclusive to anybody ever again, because it's your, it's so much more valuable in your business to have 20 things going on because then it, it, it's no different than if you're investing in the stock market. If you put all your money in Tesla, sure. It might be a fast ride up, but it's just as fast on the way down. Too. down. And so, fact. but if you spread your, you know, you diversify your portfolio, <laughs> uh, you, you are, you know, you are protecting yourself from any single client, you know, changing how they want to work. Maybe you, right. you, you know, they want to use somebody else. Maybe they want to go a different direction. So, um, so that was an important lesson to learn. Actually, I'm very grateful that I did get to learn that lesson. So, uh <laughs> No, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's important. And and it, again, this is something I can relate to just as being a touring DJ. And this is something I, I like because people ask me all the time, oh, how, I want to be a tour DJ too. Uh, I don't know if you want to be a tour DJ, my guy. Let, let me explain to you what happens. Because when the tour oh, is I over, when that tour is over, what do you what, what do you have? Nothing. <laughs> you yeah. got to figure out what you're doing next. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So like, and, and that was my lesson early too. Like I had to, I had to realize that, you know, shit isn't sweet because the tour is over. The artist is going to go record a new album and right. you're stuck. So what you're are you doing? Stuck. Yeah, exactly. What are you doing? So yeah, it, it was a necessary lesson to learn. And, and what that, what it allowed me to do actually was refocus my attention from just being an engineer. Well, one, when I finished with the Beyonce project, I got a few mixes on it. And so, and at the time I, and I had mixed the fabulous, like, uh, one song on from nothing to something Duro gave me a really, it's an interesting story there, but I've told it a hundred times. So, um, and then also he let me co-mix, uh, uh, Loso's way, but I wasn't, I wasn't getting a ton of mixing work, right? Like yeah. I was mostly, I was known as a recording engineer. And then when I finished with B, um, I said, all right, I'm going to refocus my energy onto mixing. I'll still take the engineering gigs that come in. Cause there was like, you know, little, little pitter patter of, of gigs that would come in, but I'll take those gigs. I'm not, I'm not going to turn down any money. New York's expensive to live, Fact. Uh, but, uh, but I'm really going to try to refocus my energy on mixing. And so I did that for a number of years. Right. Uh, and also started thinking outside the box and saying, well, I shouldn't just be an engineer. I should have other income streams. I should have other ways of doing business. And so I started saying, well, I have a lot of relationships in music. Why don't I right. start, um, helping brands or companies or people like connect the dots. And maybe there's some things that I can, you know, deals that I can work out and, and whatnot. And one of the first deals I did was this uh, company MSIG. They're a publicly traded like marijuana stock at the time. Uh -huh. um, and they were building like, you know, like vaporizers, like weed pens and things like that. Uh, and they wanted me to come in and help, you know, be a brand ambassador, but help them like connect the dots to other like bigger artists. And so I ended up doing a deal with, uh, Rick Ross for, for that company. And that allowed me to build a relationship with like Sav and Ross and like that team. And so I started, Sav, yep. yeah, doing things outside of just being an engineer. Um, and that's what ultimately led to where I am today. Like w when I'm sitting in the studio being a creative, so whether it's writing or mixing or producing or something where I'm in, you know, uh, have a session open. That's maybe only 25% of my time now. Uh, maybe 30. I don't know. It depends. Some weeks it's a lot more, some weeks it's less. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but 
now I have so many other things going on. Like I have my plugin, my software company. So I'm making music plugins because I know one day, hopefully not soon, but one day I'm not going to get the calls to work on the big stuff anymore. There's going to be someone 10 years younger than me who's we're, like, we're going to age ourselves out. Yeah. Yep. Age ourselves out. And so like, well, how can I continue to contribute to the space? Cause I love the, the producing space. I love the engineering space and how can I contribute to it as, as I start to get older. Um, and so creating software was a, a good start for that. And, you know, that's a, that's a business that I hope over time is going to grow and become its own standalone thing that is going to be able to run itself. So uh, let's, 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 so let's talk about the software a, a, a little bit more because I first noticed you had software when I, I got, I'm scrolling Instagram and the ad comes up. So yeah. I'm like, Oh my God, oh, I got, the, got the packs. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, we, so, so, so for, for, for the layman's out there, can can you explain what a pack is and then go in a little further for me? Okay. So, well, there's two things that we sell right now, uh, you know, sample packs, which is basically just loops and kick drum sounds and snare sounds and all the different sounds that you use to build a, a track. Um, right. But that's the smaller part of what I do. That's not really software. That's just audio sample packs. Um, the software side is like I make plugins, effects plugins. So everyone's heard of Auto-Tune. Auto-Tune is a plugin. Uh, a, a, a piece of software that goes inside your DAW software. So let's say you use Ableton or Pro Tools or Logic as your DAW where you're recording all your music. Uh, Auto-Tune would load inside of that larger piece of software. It's a plugin. Um, and so I started making my own plugins that have different effects. So I have three right now. One's called The Sauce. Uh, that was the first one. And it's like a multi effects tool. It's like a vocal chop tool. That's how it was like initially conceived. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing a lot of work with chain smokers and BTS and I was doing these like chains of effects to create these vocal chops. And I said, well, why don't I just put all that in one plugin? And so I did. So it's got like pitch and format shifting and stereo imaging and distortion, reverb delay, uh, you know, chorus flanger, all sorts of different stuff. It's multi band. Right. So we just put a ton of effects in it. Uh, and then I, I added two more, uh, spread, which is a stereo imaging tool, which makes your sounds wider or more narrow. You can change like the width of it. Um, and then we have a distortion tool called BDE and, uh, yeah. And it's just like the best distortion ever, but it's, it's a fantastic distortion. It's actually the world's first distortion with, uh, with, um, dynamic compensation. So normally in a distortion, you crush your sound. So if you have drums that you're distorting, they end up, they lose their punchiness and the attack on them because you're distorting them. So our distortion allows you to, if you want, claw that back so you can get the punchiest drums. Um, so we call it like a dynamic preservation. We're preserving the dynamics while still applying the energy and the effect of distortion. So very dope. Um, yeah. So I'm just trying to innovate and do cool things and do all the things that I want to use myself. Like every, every, we have a few things in the works right now and everything that I'm building is something that I need. It's something that I'm going to use. If I don't have a need for it, I'm never going to build it. I so, got you. What, what yeah. is Skio music? Excuse me. So bro. Skio, uh, that was sort of in the time that I was transitioning from, you know, uh, recording to mixing. In 2015, I connected with the team at Skio early when they were just getting started in Vancouver. And, um, you know, I met the team and they were really smart and I wanted to help out. They had this idea of building this uh, software or or less software, but a, a essentially a portal, a community where you could um, do remix licensing. So I could remix a song. And the biggest issue with that is not actually getting the parts. It's getting the rights to be able to share it. You don't That's have the right, right. just because you do a remix, you don't own it. You're still using That's someone right. else's stuff. So we thought, right. how do we simplify that? Well, let's build out contracts online so that you can like find the stems that you want on the website and then immediately be linked to a contract that set gives you permission to, to use it. And I thought it was a great idea. And so I started helping them out and I be, jumped on as a co-founder invested and, and um, yeah. And, and we're at over 400,000 producers on platform that we do a ton of remix contests. There's all sorts of stems that you can get there. And now Skio is starting to evolve and, and do more, try to be that like central hub that can power your business in music. Um, oh. And yeah, so that was something that was one of those transitionary that was before the plugins actually, but one of those transitionary things that was like, all right, how do I con continue to contribute to the space that I love, but not all of my contribution has to be mixing a song, right? So, so me, how so, do I so, do build other businesses? Yeah, no, I get it. And, and, and 
are you are you active in in the business anymore or are, are you I'm, in, I'm in less the, active in I mean I I speak with them probably like once a month or something like that um gotcha. I was very active in the beginning and now like it kind of is running itself and so I'm there when I'm needed um but uh yeah so and I I, got I, you. I support the contests I sponsor them with my own software and things like that yeah dope um so let's again I know we showed on time let's let's jump around a little bit more um you no, you mentioned we, we we got a little time we good okay Okay, yeah. so so let's 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 talk about you mentioned them already. Let's talk about the chain smokers and how you okay. connected with them because I remember the chain smokers were just a New York City group, but then they New York just City DJs, just DJ in the clubs, yeah. Out of here. <laughs> out of here, yeah. So that was an interesting one. Um toward the end of my I did 10 years in New York City. I lived there. Now I live in LA. Uh and I've been here since 2015. In maybe early 2015, late 2014, I want to say, um, I got an email, uh, from their manager saying, Hey, you know, I was referred to you by Imran Majid, who's now the, uh, I think co-president of Columbia. Um, and he, he's somebody who I met through Jay Sean. Uh, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm looking for some, you know, I represent this group, the chain smokers. I'm looking for somebody who can help them creatively and just be like their engineer you know, co-producer, whatever, just somebody who can help, you know, they're very capable. Like Drew's a super capable producer, but I know he wanted to sing more and do some of that. So, you know, somebody who can just help make sure that it sounds great. Right. Um, and so I said, sure. I was up at jungle city, uh, mixing something. Uh, and I said, why don't you just have them meet me at the studio and we'll just hang out for a bit. And so they came up to jungle city. I got to know them. We hung out for a bit. Um, and then, you know, maybe a month later, they sent me a song to mix. Uh, it was called uh, Good Intentions. Uh, and it was on their the EP that had roses. And uh, and then after that, I didn't hear from them for about a month. I moved to L.A. And then they send me the next song. They're like, hey, we want you to mix this other song. It's called Don't Let Me Down. So Don't Let Me Down was the second song I, I ever mixed for them. And then from there, I mixed everything after that up until um, I did the whole Memories Do Not Open album. And that's uh, so basically the the roses ep the collage ep that had closer and don't let me down um and then the memories do not open album so i was sort of like doing all the vocal production uh all the mixing recording um you know even you know co-writing on some things and yeah just being a, a collaborator with them really and just helping sort of uh you know just make sure that they sounded super polished really i get you how how did you how and maybe this is before prior to you being an engineer, but how did you get involved with songwriting with some, with some of these projects that you've been, you know, been around? I, so I started as a producer first, I was making beats in high school. So producing was always my passion and engineering right. was like my foot in the door. I got you. Know, engineering wasn't the purpose. It wasn't the goal initially. And then what I quickly realized is being an engineer made me a better producer. Cause I learned mm. all of the things on how to produce mm. better. And anytime I would get a mix, mix session to deal with, I would see all the problems in it and I'd be fixing them. So then as a producer, I could fix those problems like from the beginning. Um, and so it made me a better producer. And then the evolution of that is, well, you know, I was working with some songwriters, but it was all, I would always have more beats than I would have songs. And for a period there, like the pop industry was like, I wasn't just making hip hop stuff. I was working with Jay Sean and these other pop artists and all those pop records. Like you need top lines, like you need vocals on it or, you know, Justin Bieber's not taking a beat because at the time he wasn't writing. Um, and so I, I needed to have songs. And so I started gradually learning the skill of songwriting uh, one song at a time, only when I had an idea that made sense that really resonated. And so, um, yeah, I just kind of kept, kept practicing it and getting, trying to get better and better. And then really the songwriting, I, you know, I had some stuff on uh, the chain smokers, but uh, really the songwriting kind of kicked in with BTS. Right. So, so let's, yeah. let's go there because they are out of here. BTS yeah. dude. Yeah. I, I, I watched a couple of clips on, on, on YouTube of, of their performances and like through the computer, I can feel the screams from the crowd, yeah, the energy. It, oh, it's insane. It's, it's so it's, crazy. So, so, so you were producing and writing and mixing the songs, some of the songs uh, for BTS? Yeah. Every song I was doing something different. So, um, the first, 
thing I ever did with them was through the chain smokers, right? It, it's interesting. Like every relationship stems from the next, right. uh, or, or stems from the previous, right? Uh, so chain smokers produced a song for them. This is early before they had blown up, like well before they had blown up, at least they, they had blown up in Korea, but nobody in, in the Western world really knew them. We knew who they like, were. Right, I'm sure right. they had their, their fans. They had their like pocket fans, fans obviously. Yeah, they, sure. But it wasn't a pop thing, right? You right. would never hear BTS on the radio at the right. time. Right. And so Chainsmokers did a song, Best of Me, which I mixed. And through that, I I met their a &R and I started building a relationship with their a &R in Korea. And I just sent a few songs. I said, hey, I have a couple songs that I think could work. Like, you know, let me know. Right. Uh, in fact, she may have even asked if I had any songs and, uh, and I sent a few and two of them in the first batch of songs that I sent got picked up. And one was euphoria, um, which, uh, ended up being like a, a big sort of, uh, it's a Jungkook solo song, but a big, uh, single for them. And it was a really a popular record, yeah. song. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And then I just sort of build, started building from there and they were having me mix some records, but then also, uh, they would send me beats and say, Hey, can you just like top line? So I was getting other people's beats and they were asking me to just write on them, uh, write mostly melodies. Cause they would then change it to Korean and rewrite it and do what they need to do. But they were looking for you know, really cool melodies. And so that's how I started really building with them. And, um, and yeah, and then it was actually amazing to see like watching step-by-step step them continue to build their presence here in America in the Western music industry was amazing. Cause I've seen nothing like it. Um, I've seen nothing like their fan base and I've worked with Beyonce. She has a crazy uh, engaged fan base, but right. I can tell you right now, the BTS army is easily 20 or 30 times more active or more powerful than, than beyond. And I'm not trying to start a, a war nah, here. Yeah, whatever, yeah, I get you. Like, I get you. I you know, get you. It's just facts. Like I, I, if I tweet about BTS, it'll get 20, 30,000 retweets. If I tweet about Beyonce, it might get like a hundred <laughs> likes. It's like, it's just different. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different the, demographic. The, the Korean music industry is they, I mean, they even call them, they don't call them stars. They call them idols. Right. Mm. So it's even just how it's communicated. There's actually, I think a lot that the Western music industry can learn from the Korean music industry packaging. Mm. For example, I just, I, I produced a song for this group twice and just the other day, uh, yesterday, actually they sent me a packaging of their album and they signed it and did everything. And it's beautiful. It's like a whole booklet. It's like hard cover. It's got the CD on one insert. It's got like all sorts of different photos and Polaroids and stickers. And then the whole booklet, it's like this whole thick package and um, pause <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and BTS is the same. Like they have these beautiful packaging, beautiful artwork, beautiful. Like they write the lyrics out English, Korean, everything. It's actually amazing. And I actually, it, it makes each album like a collectible. And so that was one of the amazing things I learned from them is like, the Western industry can do so much more, but we're on this, like, you know, just quick, quick consumption, throw it on Spotify, get the streams, move on to the next, throw it on Spotify. And in the Western or in the, uh, Korean industry, they found a way to continue to get people to buy a physical album. And, you know, mm. you make more money on a, on a physical album because you can charge more for it. And right. um, the artist makes more money. It's just like better, you know, for business than a stream. For everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so they have an, a very active physical base. People are still buying CDs. And by the way, they may never listen to the CD. They may never pull the CD out of the case, but they still want to have that booklet because it's a piece of art. Um, and I think that's something that uh, a lot of the Western industry has forgotten about. Although we are seeing some of the like, you know, limited edition vinyls and things like vinyls, that. And right. That is starting to come back. So I actually really love seeing that because I think that's that can eventually lead itself into this larger. Uh, ecosystem of getting people here to want to collect a physical thing. So, um, so be before we jumped, jumped on this call today, um, I, I, I was talking to Jay Sean and I told him, Hey, um, I'm, I'm going to have a conversation with swivel. What should I ask him? And oh, he I'm said, yo. Jokes. <laughs> no, like my brother. that's like, yo, yeah. he said to me, Ask Swivel about when I used to pay Duro in cash for the sessions. Oh, yes. So, yeah, 2008. I remember this. 
2008 KMA Studios. First time I ever met Jay Sean. So uh, now his wife, Tara, was signed to Duro as an artist. She was actually Prior. on Fabulous's third on Real Talk. She was on that song, um, Ghetto. She was singing the yes. hook. So that's how we met Jay Sean is because they s- formed a relationship, I guess, on from tour. And then, you know, Tara introduced Jay to her producer, Jeremy and Duro and everybody. And Duro was mixing uh, My Own Way, his album. And he would pay Duro in cash. But here's the funny thing, though. It wasn't like he would have a stack of cash. That's normal. We've all, you know, we've all had sure. a couple of those. He had to get not travelers checks, like travelers money where you go to like an at, you get it at the airport and it's in like a plastic wrap. And it's like, you get a hundred dollars in a plastic wrap thing. And it's got like a whatever. Cause it's a foreign currency. Yeah. yeah. And he would have, he would just have a stack of these things, but to get the bills out, you had to open up this package and pull like a hundred dollars out or $200 out. And so I just remember on the table, there was just a pile of these like, like travelers check things that just had us dollars in it, but it wasn't like loose dollars that you would get out of an ATM. It was like each hundred dollar bill was packaged itself. So it was like, (laughs) it was like, it was, it was hilarious. It was so funny. Um, but all the money was there. It was just like in this enormous, like you think you're getting a million dollars in a duffel bag. And really it's like, you know, maybe there's like five grand in there or something. I don't know. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> that's how he, he was paying at the time <laughs> through these like travelers check things. It was hilarious. So, so FYI, people, Jay Sean is originally from London. This is this is. I'm assuming this is part of the reason why he was doing. Yeah, this. he's traveling from London. He's probably at the airport. Like, oh, I don't have U.S. dollars. How do I, uh, you know? But for, I, what confused me is like normally you go to the airport, you go, you go uh, to like the currency exchange, and you just, you know, you get your money in cash, like. It wasn't like that. Each bill was prepackaged in a in a cellophane wrap. You had to unwrap each bill. It was it was the funniest thing ever. Oh yeah. my god! Sw- swivel, swivel. Um, yeah. <laughs> Listen, this this is my this is my first season of, of doing the podcast. I'd love it if you come on for season I'll two, be so, back. We can, so so we can yeah. tell some more stories. I love um, it. Um, people, this is my friend DJ Swivel. Um, swivel, where can they find you on on Instagram, brother? Uh, on all social media, it's just at DJ swivel, Instagram, Twitter, clubhouse. If you're on the, like, you know, just follow me everywhere. YouTube slash DJ swivel, go follow the YouTube channel. Lots of great nuggets there. And I break down mixes and songs that I produced and things like that. That's a fact. He, he does story time. He does in the mix and then, uh, just the tips pause. Yep. Yep. Um, so listen, go fo- there's an S there is an S. <laughs> Go follow yeah. my friend DJ Swivel. Swivel, I appreciate your time today, man. But let's let's do some Thank more you, again Red. later. Appreciate um, it's great you. seeing you, brother. I appreciate you, man. This is Wave Files, people. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. <laughs>